would you open with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22? Deuteronomy 22, our text today will be verses 6 through 12. But as we turn there, let's pray. Father, we, we believe the words that Paul wrote by your inspiration, that all of the scriptures are profitable. And so we come to texts today that are obscure, that we don't quite understand, and yet we fully expect to meet you. We, we, we know that Hebrews tells us whenever we read from your word that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. So Father, we ask that you would give us open ears, open hearts, and, and believing hearts. We also think about Hebrews telling us that the, the word did not profit those who did not believe. And so, God, we ask that you would benefit us, bless us with your word today, but we know that you also have to give us soft, humble, and believing hearts to hear from your word. So we pray that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things in your law, and we pray that, above all, you would help us to see Jesus who fulfilled the law for us and was crucified for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you haven't been with us, we are in Deuteronomy 22, verse 6. We've been in a study of Deuteronomy for a little over the last two years. We're planning on being done this year unless the Lord returns first, which we're all hoping for. Amen. However, with that being said, if the Lord doesn't return first, we are in the doldrums of Deuteronomy. Now, I'm not saying that to disparage God's word in any way. I just prayed that we, we believe what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, that all of God's word is profitable. And I think you agree with me, amen? We believe the words of David in Psalm 19, that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. I believe that you believe that, amen? The trouble is, there are some times when we come across laws that for one reason or another, they simply don't apply to us. And there's a couple of those in this text. The other trouble is that a couple of the laws that we're gonna read about this morning Nobody's actually entirely sure what they were meant for to begin with, because it's been so long ago. So today's text in particular is going to be a bit challenging on top of the fact that your poor little preacher has had a cold for the last few days. So you guys are in for it. But the good news is we fully expect God to speak to us from his word. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the text together. I'm going to give you the theme that I think underlies all of the text and, and how I think that theme puts everything together. Um, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to give you what I've got in terms of the research that I did and, and what did these laws mean or what do people think that they meant. But just know that there's some of these things are so old that we're not 100% sure. So I'm going to do my best in telling you what these seem to mean and then we're going to tie them together under that theme again, and we're going to make application. Okay? Sound good? I hope so, because you're stuck. <laughs> Deuteronomy 22, starting in verse 6. If you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs, and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go. But the young you may take for yourself, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long. When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. You shall make yourself tassels on the four corners of your garment with which you cover yourself. Now you see what I'm talking about, don't you? Here's the theme. I'm going to give it to you now. We'll walk through the statutes individually, and then we'll come back to the theme at the end. There's a theme that I think underlies all of these, and, and we're going to see that with that theme, there's overlap with us as well. The theme is given to us in, in Leviticus 25:23. And in Leviticus 25, 23, God is telling Israel different things that they can and can't do with the land. And, and God says, you cannot use a plot of land as, as security, right? You can't use that as a guarantee for a loan or as a guarantee for something. And the reason that he gives is this, the land is mine. 
you are strangers and sojourners with me. That's interesting, isn't it? You know what would be fascinating would be to survey the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and, and to ask how many times does Moses say the Lord your God is giving you this land? The Lord your God is giving you this land. The Lord your God is giving you this land. Do this or don't do that in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. It'd be fascinating to find the number of times that the word giving is used in the Torah. But do you see, here's the temptation. As many times as God says, I'm giving it to you, I'm giving it to you, I'm giving it to you, the temptation is to think, well, then it's ours, right? So in Leviticus 25, 23, God clarifies, well, I'm giving it to you, but I'm not actually relinquishing my ownership. It's not entirely yours. You're not the owners of the house. I'm the owner of the house. You're the tenants. You are strangers and sojourners with me. We like to sing, this land is my land. This land is your land. Does not apply. It is not true. Scripture makes it clear that God owned the promised land. And as I'll come back to after Moving through this, God didn't just own Canaan. God owns the fullness. God owns the entire earth. Amen? Amen. So with God's ownership and Israel's being tenants in the land, God gives them a few, you could say it's the lease, right? God gives them a few statutes, and really it's not just a few here, it's the whole Torah. This is the lease. These are the rules that you'll adhere to in the land, and if you don't, I'm going to boot you out. And that's what happens, isn't it? So with that in mind, God owns the land. Israel are strangers and sojourners in the land. There's a few statutes that they receive for how they're to conduct themselves in God's land. The first one has to do with birds and eggs, and we find that in verses 6 and 7. I'm calling this careful consumption. How is Israel to conduct themselves under God's ownership with careful consumption. Look at verse six again. If you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go and the young you may take for yourself that it may go well with you and that you may live long. Now, there's some debate about what precisely the meaning of this is or what exactly the intent of this was. But to me, The option that made the most sense in the reading that I did is this is about careful consumption. And what I mean by that is the fact that God has given us ownership of the land in a sense. God, as we talked about in Sunday school, made us in his image. And part of the purpose of that was for us to rule over the fish and the the birds and the animals and the creeping things, right? But if we're going to abuse that, then we just blindly consume whatever we want. And so there's examples throughout the Torah and throughout the rest of scripture where God says, yeah, you guys are made in my image. Yes, you do have ownership to a degree, but you can't just blindly consume whatever you want. And so in this instance, we see a a nest and, and a bird and eggs. Now, we actually talked about this a few weeks ago. Do you remember? We talked about in a time of warfare, Israel was given instructions for which trees they could use and which trees they weren't allowed to use. Do you remember that? Is that ringing a bell? And and if you remember, what I suggested was that God did not allow Israel to go scorched earth on their enemies. God wanted Israel to to rule over the land and to use and to consume the land, but to do so in a careful way. Now, here's what's happening with a bird and with eggs. You're out and about. At my old church in Mountain Home, it was a train. There was always a train. And my pastor would say, you need to remember that there's a trumpet coming someday, right? (laughs) Problem is I lost my place. Uh, Careful consumption. Well, I'll just jump ahead. What would the natural response be? If you come up, okay, you're out and about, you find a bird's nest, right? It's interesting that this is not on your property. This is you're out and about, you're on the way, and you see a bird in a nest, and it has either young or eggs. The commentary has pointed out the natural reaction would be, hey, look at that, all of that's mine, right? I get lunch. I get it eggs and a chicken or, or whatever else is out there. You, you get a whole meal for the whole family. Now, the limit that's being placed is, no, not all of it is yours. You can take the young, and you can grow those chicks up or cook them or whatever, 
You can have the eggs, you can have a nice little omelet, but you leave the mother. And so what's happening? Well, you are consuming what's there in front of you, and yet you're also leaving the source of food for later on. It's careful consumption. And you notice what the benefit is or what the incentive is at the end of verse 7. It says that it may go well with you and that you may live long. Some people think that this is, you know, the promise that's given to um, the fifth commandment with honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. This is about long prosperity in the land. This is about consuming in a way where you're not just eating everything that's in front of you. You're not just harvesting and taking everything that's in front of you. You are carefully consuming. Yes, consuming what God has put within your stewardship and yet doing so in a careful way that promotes longevity and prosperity. So how does God want Israel to live in the land? Not with blind consumption, not taking whatever they want, with careful consumption. Now, what does that mean for us? Good question. We'll come back to it. Number two is careful construction. This one's a little bit clear. This one's pretty easy to tell what it is with, with maybe one historical comment. Verse eight is careful construction. When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Now, here's one clarifying note in case maybe some of you are confused. I think everybody in this room, perhaps, their roof is slanted, right? And so you're going, why would I put a guardrail around a slanted roof? That doesn't make sense. Because in Israel, they did not have slanted roofs. In Israel, when they constructed a house, the roof was flat, and it was like another living room, or it was like a guest room. In fact, when you read 1 Samuel, I think it's in chapter 9, when Saul is out and about, and he runs into Samuel, and Samuel tells him, hey, I want you to come to my house for dinner. I've got some news for you. And he tells him that he's the king. Do you know where Saul stayed? On the roof. You know where Saul slept? on the roof. So with the roof being flat and the roof being used for a living space and even for a sleeping quarters, well, that makes more sense why you would put a guardrail around it, wouldn't it? God wants Israel in his land to be aware of their neighbors and the way that they construct their houses. Notice also the responsibility that's given in verse eight. It says that if somebody does fall, I hope this doesn't happen every week. Is this gonna happen every week? It's okay. That's more important, right? We're praying that whoever it is as well. When you build a new house, notice that the, the contingency there, or actually the, the guilt there, is that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if someone should fall from it. God holds you responsible for the things that happen to your neighbor in your house. Now, we should clarify that that's due to your negligence. Right? If your neighbor comes over and gets drunk in your house and does something stupid on his own volition, well, that's not really your fault, is it? But if you construct your house and you know that God has these laws for the way that you construct your house, and if you neglect it, and if your neighbor gets hurt because of your negligence, God holds the guilt of innocent blood on your household. Boy, that's fascinating, isn't it? That's powerful. And so how does God want Israel to live as tenants in his land? He wants them to, to do so with careful construction, with an awareness of the safety of their neighbors when they come over. You know, it's easy for us as individuals to know, well, I, I know that the edge is there, or I know that there's a sharp corner there, or I know that this is there, but God wants us to be aware of our neighbors and the way that we construct our homes and in the way that we are, are mindful of safety within our, home, in our own homes. So we have careful construction, we have careful consumption. Now, Thirdly, we have deliberate distinctions in verses 9 through 11. And here's where we get to the stuff that we're not 100% sure on what it means. There's three careful distinctions. There's seed, there's animals, and there's fabric. Let's read those again. Verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. These are all deliberate distinctions, right? These are not blending two things that don't go together. We're not 100% we're not sure what it means, but many of the commentaries that I read actually lumped this in with what we talked about last week, male and female, right? There is a distinction between male and female, and that is not a line that is to be crossed. And here, it seems like maybe that's continuing the theme. God has made distinctions, and he doesn't want those to be crossed. 
The trouble is, like I said, we don't know 100% sure. We're not 100% sure on what that means. So let me give you what I've got. Is that fair? First of all, you have the seed that comes up in verse nine. Don't sow your field or your vineyard with two different kinds of seed. The best explanation that I found was that that was a pagan practice. That there was a group of people who they would sow two different kinds of seed together because they felt like that's what they had to do in order for the gods to bless their crops. And so what, what's being said here is not just a distinction. It's not just a certain way of sowing seed. It's who, who are you putting your faith in? Are you going to go with the pagan practices and do the stuff that they do to make sure that their gods are happy with them and bring harvest? Or are you going to listen to the Torah's rules for harvest and not sow things together and trust that the God of Israel will bring a harvest if you obey him? And so this is, this is distinguishing Israel from the pagans. This is setting them aside and they say, yeah, we know that that works for you guys. Or we know that maybe you think that the guys, that the gods bless you guys for sowing in that way. We don't do that at all. We trust that God is going to bring our harvest. And it's not about necessarily our sowing technique. It's about our obedience to the covenant that God has given us. Israel, in other words, if this is true, is showing their faith in the God of Israel by not sowing seed the way that the pagans did. Now, verse 10 talks about not plowing with two kinds of animals, with an ox and a donkey together. And actually, I think in the Hebrew, it's a little bit more ambiguous. It's not necessarily an ox or a donkey. It's just plowing with two different kinds of animals. This is weird because the commentaries pointed out, well, this is actually just a humanitarian thing. If you plow with a larger animal and a smaller animal, then you're actually just being cruel to that smaller animal because the larger animal is going to be able to pull it and work it harder than it can go. And so you're actually just showing kindness to the smaller animal by not yoking it with something that's larger. Right? And so this might not necessarily be about distinctions. It's about kindness towards the smaller animal, to the donkey. Now we have another distinction in verse 10, and that's sewing with two different kinds of fabric. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. Now, interestingly, if you go back and read Leviticus, which I know you do often, the, the garments of the priests were actually a mix of different kinds of fabric. And so there's a couple of different explanations that people have. Number one, again, this was probably a pagan practice. People wore different kinds of fabrics woven together for the sake of their religious worship or for the sake of the favor of the gods or something like that. And or that was a privilege that was given to the Levitical priests. The Levitical priests were allowed to wear stuff that was, was sewn of different kinds of fabric, but they're holy, right? They, they're set apart from the rest of Israel. We're not them. And so we're going to not do that. So it's another distinction. So how is God telling Israel to conduct themselves in the land? Well, with deliberate distinctions, knowing that there's a little bit of question mark on what exactly those were. Now, there's one final one that we find in verse 12, and that's with tassels. We'll call that deliberate decoration. Now, this one, thankfully, we know pretty much what it means. Verse 12, you shall make for yourself tassels on the four corners of your garment with which you cover yourself. Now, we know what it means because there's another passage that describes it in more detail. And so if you want to, turn with me to Numbers chapter 15. It should just be a few pages to the left. Numbers 15, starting in verse 37. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and to remember all the commandments of the Lord your God, to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you're inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Here we are given the specific 
purpose of the tassels. What are they? Number one, they are a reminder of the covenant. Israel is marked with a visible marker on their clothing that reminds them that they are in covenant with God. And and if you just think about it on an individual level, you know it's super easy to forget the stuff that you're wearing, right? You you wear stuff and you're, oh, I forgot I put that on today. Or even, especially if you have something like this on all of your clothes, it's really easy to forget. But now imagine that an entire community is wearing tassels and that we can remind each other of our tassels. Hey, you're sitting on my tassel. Hey, your tassel's caught in this. And it's a reminder of the covenant. It's a reminder that we're in covenant with God and he has given us rules. He has not just given us rules, he's given us a new relationship. He's elevated us, he's, he's set us apart from the rest of the world. And every time we, have a, we see a tassel on our clothes, every time we put on our clothes, we have a physical decorative reminder of the covenant that God has made with the nation of Israel. That's the first purpose. It's a reminder of the covenant. But there's a second purpose that's easy to miss if you're not careful. Did you catch what color that there's a cord supposed to be? See verse 33, or sorry, verse 39, verse 38, somewhere around there. Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corner of their garments and throughout their generations to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. Here's the funny thing about blue. Not a lot of people had blue clothes back in those days because blue paint, blue ink, blue dye was very expensive to produce. So guess who wore blue? Basically just royalty, the aristocracy, the nobility. If you were wearing blue, it meant that you were rich. But see, another commentator pointed out, yeah, but any Israelite could afford just one quart of blue. And so Israel is being marked, not just with the covenant, but also, also they're, wearing the cover, they're wearing the color of nobility. They're wearing the color of royalty. And so what is Israel being reminded of with their blue clothes? It's not just the covenant. It's the fact that God has given us a new status. It's the fact that God has given us a new identity. This is something we've talked about throughout Deuteronomy in a couple of places, especially in chapters 7 through 9 or thereabouts. It's God saying, look, the whole world is mine. And all of the nations belong to me in a sense. And I could have chosen any nation that I wanted to, and I picked you. And God made them royalty. Israel is referred to with royal language throughout the scriptures. For example, uh, when God first sends Moses to Pharaoh, Pharaoh to go, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, Thus says the Lord, let my people go. I want my firstborn son, Israel. Now, when God calls Israel his firstborn son, that's royalty language. Only royalty back in those days were known as the children of God. And so when David says in Psalm 2, God said to me, you're my son today, I have begotten you. That's David saying that I am God's chosen king. The children of deities were royalty. And so here, with the blue cord, with you are my son, with let me have my firstborn son, God is making it clear that he has chosen Israel to be what he calls them in other places, a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood nation. He has exalted them above the nations, and he will use them for a special purpose above the rest of the nations and over all the earth. And of course, that's fulfilled and and seen in the work of Jesus ruling over all creation. But nonetheless, he's showing as as the train is moving that way, as, as the dominoes are falling that way, as God's plan is unfolding, he's saying, Israel, you are my royal nation. And if it's true that you're my royal nation, then I want you to look royal to other people. I want you to wear tassels on your garments, and I want you to have one of the cords in each of your tassels dyed blue. So what do we have in Deuteronomy this morning? We have a lease. We have the rules of what it means to be tenants in God's land. The land belongs to God. He says again in Leviticus 25, 23, the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. And if that's true, he's giving them rules for the lease of how they ought to conduct themselves in the land with careful consumption, with careful construction, with deliberate distinctions and decorations. So where do we go from here? Because if we just went home from here, you'd go, that was interesting and maybe kind of nice. What do we do? Now I want to show you the overlap between them and us. 
Now, what I don't want to do is bring us back under the old covenant. That's Judaizing, as we've talked about in the past. And there are distinctions between us and Israel. Things did look different back then compared to the way that they do now. And so I don't want to tell you to go home and wear tassels on your garments any more than I would tell you that you go home and can't eat bacon or shrimp. So I don't want to bring us back under the old covenant. Ephesians chapter 2 says that Christ has abolished the law in the sense that it separates Jews from Gentiles. That's what's happening here. The Jews are being separated from the Gentiles. So if those are the distinctions, and if it's, if it's not for us to go back under the old covenant, then where's the overlap or where's the application? I think, again, it's back in our theme. God says, the land is mine, and you are strangers and sojourners with me. The land is mine. Beloved, does that just apply to Israel? No. The whole earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. That's from Psalm 24. The whole earth is the Lord's and its fullness thereof. In another place, in Psalm 50, God says, The whole world is mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. All the cattle are mine. And if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't need to. Because everything is mine already. And we've already, we've talked about early in Deuteronomy how he's not just the God of Israel, although he is in a special way, but he's the Lord of all the nations. And so, beloved, if it's true that God didn't just own Canaan, but he also owns Idaho, then it is, all, is it also true that if they were responsible to God for their living in the land, then are we also responsible to God for how we conduct ourselves in the land? I think so. I, I understand that it's a little bit of a walk to get there, but I think there is a parallel. Now, let's also fast forward what he said to Israel in Leviticus 25 when he says, you guys are strangers and sojourners with me. Is that not also true of us? Are we not also strangers and sojourners with God? Friends, that's even more true today than it was of the nation of Israel. And, and you say, why? Well, it's true in the sense that we're just his tenants, but it's also true in the sense that God has made us his strangers and his sojourners. God has made us his tenants. Now, he did that for Israel too. You go read Leviticus and you find God saying, look, I brought you out of the nation of Egypt so that you could be my people and so that I could be your God. I purchased you at the Passover. Now, has God not done that for us? He has purchased us in Christ, our Passover lamb, who has been sacrificed for us. And I want you to think about the difference there. Think about the fact that before we became God's strangers and sojourners, that we were just fine at home in the world. We were just fine. Our citizenship was in this world, and we fit in great, and everything was hunky-dory, right? Except for the fact that God's wrath was abiding on us. And so how was it that God made us his strangers and sojourners? How was it that he exchanged our citizenship here for that in heaven? He did it by, first of all, sending Jesus to be a stranger and a sojourner among us. Now you think about that. Who created the world? Jesus. Who wasn't recognized and received by the world? Jesus. Who was hanged on a tree? Jesus. I, I can't remember who said it. I should have wrote it down ahead of time. Somebody said that Jesus gave the breath to the people who crucified him. Jesus prepared the tree on which he was to be crucified. Now think about that. Here is God who should be at home in the world. It is his world. And yet when Jesus takes on a body and becomes one of us and, and, and dwells among us, he is a stranger and a sojourner. What was he doing? Well, for one, he was showing us how to live as strangers and sojourners. And number two, he was actually purchasing us and making us his strangers and sojourners. This is what Hebrews 13 says. Hebrews 13, 11 through 14. This is not entire. This is kind of a paraphrase. It says that sacrifices are burned outside of the camp. And so Jesus suffered outside the city gate to sanctify people through his blood. So let us go outside of the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. So what was Jesus doing? He was, in a sense, taking away our passport that was from earth and giving us a passport from heaven. 
He was taking away our citizenship that was of the earth, and he was giving us citizenship of heaven. In other words, as God took Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land, God is in the process of bringing us out of the world, making us strangers and sojourners, and, and, and taking us to the promised land that's not in this world. See the overlap? The land is God's. We are his strangers and sojourners, and so we are obligated. We are responsible. We are accountable to him for how we conduct ourselves and how we use his land. Here's the trouble with it. There's, there's a couple of things. One of them is when we get into a theology of the land, we have a hard time walking a tightrope. You see, on the one hand, when we talk about the way that we use the land, and when we talk about the way that, that we're supposed to live before Christ returns, there's a ditch on both sides of the road, and we usually fall into one or the other. And here's what I mean by that. For one, beloved, is it true that Jesus could come back today? Amen. I hope he does. It'd be great. When I was at the conference a few weeks ago, one of the speakers was preaching on Acts chapter 10. And, you know, Peter is preaching to the Gentiles. And it says that while he was still speaking, the spirit rushed in there and repeated Pentecost among the Gentiles, right? And the, pre the guy said, the spirit interrupted Peter's sermon. He says, you have heard sermons that you wish the spirit would have interrupted, <laughs> right? I've preached sermons that I wish the Spirit would have interrupted. Where was I going with that? Oh. When it comes to living in the land, when it comes to how we ought to view time and how we ought to basically invest in the world, one of the ditches that we fall into is that Jesus could come back today, and so therefore, we shouldn't worry about the, the world 10 years from now. We shouldn't worry about the world 50 years from now. We certainly shouldn't worry about the world 100 years from now because there is no way that Jesus is not going to come back within the next 100 years. But how many people have said that in church history? So do you see, if all we ever think about is heaven, well, that, that's, that's good in a sense, but in another sense, we might be tempted to neglect this world. Now, let's go to the other side. There are other folks who believe that Jesus is not going to return for the next 10,000 years, maybe. Right? And so... What do they lose? Well, on the one hand, they lose the urgency. One of the things that the New Testament tells us is there's an urgency with the return of Christ and that we ought to be living now as if he is coming back today. So they lose that. But do you know what those folks have going for them? They have a longer vision for how we ought to be discipling our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, and for the work that we ought to be doing in our community, and for what we ought to be doing for our nation in the long haul, you see there are strengths and weaknesses on both sides. And so we ought to walk kind of in the middle. But the middle is a tightrope. On one hand, well, Jesus could come back today, so I should take out as much credit card debt as I can. <laughs> on the other hand, you get what I'm saying. I'm kind of talking in circles now. Let's rope it back into Deuteronomy. We are to live as strangers and sojourners, and we are to know that this is not our home. Here we have no lasting city. Middleton is not our lasting city. Caldwell is not our lasting city. Our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is somewhere else, and we're waiting for Jesus to come from that somewhere else. That's a paraphrase of Philippians chapter 3. And so, on the one hand, we ought to be living as if he could come back today. But on the other hand, Deuteronomy and the rest of Scripture are like, yeah, but be careful in the way that you live in the land. Live as God's strangers and sojourners, but assume that you're going to live to see your great-grandchildren and disciple them. It's a tough place to be. People call it the already, not yet. There's some things that are already fulfilled and yet not yet fulfilled, and it's we're in this in-between stage of history. Walking between the two is a tightrope. And so what ought we to do? If it's true that we're God's strangers and sojourners, if it's true that God owns Idaho too, well then what ought we to do? We ought to be careful in our consumption. Now, some of you are getting nervous when I say that. And it's a shame. Here is a fact. Conservatives, well, I'm going to say here's my perception. I shouldn't say here's a fact. Here's my perception. Conservatives don't talk about environmental care. 
Whenever we start talking about environmental care in our nation, Al Gore gets the microphone. And it's global warming, which was supposed to end the world in like 2017, I think. And AOC said that we have 12 years left, which by my reckoning is 2030. Whenever we start getting into environmental care, it's the progressives and the wokies that have the market on the discussion. And beloved, that ought not be. There ought to be a biblical, reformed perspective on what it means to carefully consume the land. There ought to be a biblical, reformed perspective on what it means to be, to be concerned for the environment. And I don't know what that is, because we're not talking about it. Scripture does tell us to consume. Scripture also tells us, tells us to be carefully consuming. So what ought we to do? Well, there you go. Fill in the blank. Find some application there. Here, here's maybe an application. One of you can become a reformed scholar and you can write a dissertation on the reformed perspective of what it means to be environmentally aware. And you can, ded- to me, you can dedicate it to Middleton First Baptist Church. How's that? But run it by me first. Make sure that it's what we would care about, appreciate, agree with. What does it look like to carefully consume? I think it's the difference between hunting for meat and mowing down every animal that you see. But that's about as far as that I, I can take it. I don't really know. What does it mean to carefully construct? Well, honestly, the government has taken over a lot of building codes. In a lot of ways, that's helpful because they know better than we do what to do. And, and, and maybe is it overblown? Some of you guys are like, really? Did you just say that the government knows better than us? 1984, anyone? This is one of those ones that I wish the spirit would interrupt. <clears throat> Be mindful of your neighbors in the way that you keep your house. Be mindful of your neighbors. I'll just leave it there. You fill in the blank. Careful distinctions. Are there pagan practices that we can distinguish ourselves from? Careful decorations. Are there ways that we can be physically, visibly marked with the covenant of God? Now, can that be abused? Sure it can. Jesus said the, the, the Pharisees love to make their phylacteries long. They love to do that. And so it's easy for us to, okay, let's come up with some kind of a physical marker. And then that becomes our merit badge that we we show to the rest of the world and say, we're better than the rest of you. Obviously, that's a misapplication, isn't it? But is there some kind of way that we as God's people can be marked? Now, primarily, I would say that should be by holiness, not by clothing. So, does God own the land? Yes. Yes. Are we strangers and sojourners with God? Yes. And so what ought we to do? We ought to remember the high price that Jesus paid to make us his strangers and sojourners. We ought to remember the way that he conducted himself as a stranger and a sojourner. And we ought to love him and to follow him in living as God's tenants in the land. Amen? Don't beat me up afterwards, okay? Let's pray. Father, again, we we open the way that we close the way that we open. We are convicted that your word has something for us today. We are convicted that your spirit speaks through us whenever we read your word, even if it's about tassels and eggs. So, Father, if there is something that I've said that was wrong, I pray that you would cause each of us to forget about it and show us where I went wrong. Lord, if there's any way that we can apply this text in a way that I've not discussed, we pray that you would help us not just to um, go home and forget what we've read, but we pray that this would be a good challenge for us to meditate on your law as, as David prescribes in Psalm chapter 1. That if we meditate on your law, we will be happy, blessed folks who are, who are like trees planted by streams of water. We eagerly await your blessing, even though your text might be slightly obscure today. We thank you that your word is powerful, even when we come to texts like this one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.